um, I told you we would get to this topic, and that is spiritual warfare. There is a warfare going on. There is a, a Satan, and there are uh, demonic forces that are against you, but I want to bring some, some perspective, New Testament, biblical perspective to, that, to this topic because, quite honestly, we don't talk about it that often. I don't like giving the enemy much attention. I've discovered in life what you give attention to, you draw more of. <laughs> and uh, I had some uh, friends years ago that they saw the devil behind everything. I mean, they saw uh, a demon spirit behind a flat tire, behind somebody pulled in front of me, that's the devil, that's the devil. They looked for the devil, they saw the devil, they found the devil, and the devil just tormented them. It was crazy. When we were kids growing up in the denomination that I grew up in, we, were we literally were taught this, that the demon powers were all over in Africa. Now, this is true. I know you laugh about it, but it's true. Did any of you grow up in a denomination where you were taught that, it was they, that here in America, because we were founded on Christian principles, that you know, you didn't have much demonic activity. And maybe not compared to Africa, but did anybody, am I the only one? So anyway, uh, as we begin to grow in the word and grow in faith, we begin to understand, um, especially when you are evangelizing and witnessing to people, you will see more demonic activity in the lives of people because the devil doesn't want to give up. Like that song we just sang, hell lost another one. Well, how many of you know the enemy that is alive and, and active, he doesn't want to lose another one uh, from his grip. And so I want to talk a little bit of, about this because uh, the first time I personally, I mean, I knew of and I heard a lot of testimonies and stories, but the first time I ever personally encountered someone that was demon oppressed or demon possessed was when I was street witnessing and I ran into some people like that, okay? That, and then anytime you start something new or you are pressing into a new area of, of uh, revival or a new area. Like back in the 90s when we started our Club X ministry, we had worked hard, we'd prayed, we'd met with all the high schools in the area. They were pretty open to us. And uh, in fact, they were surprisingly open to us. And we started the dance club and we didn't know exactly how it would go, but we started. And the very first night, I mean, we had a spotlight. We, didn't, we, we, we thought we'd be happy if we had 150, 200 kids, but there wasn't even enough room. This building wasn't built yet and there wasn't even enough room to get them in the door. We had uh, estimated over 2,000 kids, young people show up, but the first one that showed up was a demon possessed guy. And it wasn't borderline demon possession. I'm up in my office upstairs and I'm getting ready for the evening. We knew this. We knew we were going to create an atmosphere and a place where the kids could come. And then we would do what we called on Friday nights. This was, by the way, this was not, this was hardcore evangelism. This was not sweet church group. Now, I love sweet church group, but this was raw evangelism with us unsaved kids on the premises, which is just like, gives me cold chills and goosebumps. That's where my, put me in the middle of a, a motorcycle gang and let me, that's where I thrive, okay? I love being around lost people who are not a little lost, a lot lost, because I, I can connect with them and it's just my favorite, okay? So I'm up in my office getting ready for it. And while I'm up there, boom, 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 Somebody's beating on my door. I'm like, dear Lord, who is this? I open the door and this look, pastor, pastor, you have to get down here. You have to get down here. And so I came down the steps. As soon as I hit the top part of the steps over there, as soon as I hit that step, I saw, they didn't even explain to me what was going on, but I saw the dude and I knew instantly in my spirit, I knew this guy was demon-possessed. 
But what made him come here? I know this, the devil always overplays his hand. And from the top of the steps, I just stopped. I didn't have time to mess around. I'm busy. It's a distraction. And I don't know if the guy really wants to be free or not, but he, at least in this moment, he's going to be free, or at least he's going to be bound up. From the top of the steps, I just pointed at him with authority, and I said, because I hadn't done this like this ever before, I just knew the right thing to do, and there wasn't options left. I couldn't call the intercessors. I couldn't call the prayer warriors. I just looked at the guy and I pointed at him and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to be free. Now, this is what was so cool. We hadn't let the young people in the building yet. They're all at the windows. They're seeing this guy and they're thinking, what a freak. The guy was manifesting and he's there and all the kids are at the window and their faces are pressed against the windows and they're all looking in. And when I said, in the name of Jesus, I said it with authority and I wasn't being mean to the guy, I'm being mean to the devil. Yes. And I took authority and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave this man alone. Well, what was so weird, I had never experienced this before, the guy flew back about 10 or 15 feet, he hit the glass windows with his back. Boom, it was like someone punched him in the gut. And <laughs> I know this is weird, but this is true. This slimy crap flew out of his mouth and it looked like someone took a bucket of slime and just <laughs> threw it on the window. And, and here, here's why I said the devil overplays his hand. This, the kids all witnessed this. Yeah. And the kids were watching this and they were like, <laughs> they were looking at each other. And when we finally opened the doors, we got the guy out and we had two of our workers minister to him. And, and when the kids all came in, they're going, dude. That was awesome. And they were, you know, these aren't church kids, so they're saying, that pastor is bad. <laughs> the devil overplays his hand. And he wants you to be afraid or to be intimidated. But I'm going to share some scripture with you today. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, Jesus had sent the 70 out to minister. And the scripture says in verse 17, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And I love what Jesus did. He downplayed it. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning a flash from heaven. Behold, I've given you authority and power to trample upon serpents, scorpions, and physical and mental strength and ability over the power that the enemy possesses. And nothing, circle the word nothing, and nothing shall in any way harm you. Nevertheless, I like what he said. Nevertheless, don't rejoice at this, that the spirits are subject to you but rejoice that your names are enrolled in heaven. In other words, the bigger party, the bigger party isn't that you have authority over the devil. The biggest and the best joy and the best party ought to be that you're saved, that the blood of Jesus washed away your sins. Oh, that you're going to heaven. Are you with me? And so Jesus was given a little bit of perspective uh, one scripture I didn't have up here on the screen, but I want you to hear it. Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus was talking to Peter. You know the story where he said, who do men say that I am? And he comes back, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ. Well, in verse 18, he said this, I will build my church and the gates of hell, the powers uh, in the Amplified, it gives the Greek meaning of this, the powers of the infernal region shall not overpower the church. 
or be strong enough to deter it from against it. I give you, here it is, verse 19, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind and declare to be improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose or declare to be unlawful on earth, uh, lawful on earth must be what is already loosed in heaven. In other words, Jesus was saying, look, church, this is for the church. I've given you authority. I'm going to be talking about authority soon and what specifically your authority is because a lot of us don't know our authority. We really don't know who we are, our identity. That's kind of what this series has been about. So let me just bring some clarity from God's word to how Satan works and then how that relates to you. Uh, Satan works through lies. His power's been defeated. How does he have any power? Well, with lies. John chapter 8 and verse 44, your father, he's talking to the Pharisees, your father is the devil, and you do exactly what he wants. He's always been a murderer and a liar, and there is nothing Circle that word again, nothing. Nothing truthful about him. He speaks his own, and one translation says his own native language, and this translation in the Amplified says, and everything he speaks is a lie. Not only is a liar himself, but he is also the father of all lies. So I want you to know how he works. Number one, he works in deception. How does he do that? He lies. If you'll tune in today and if you'll sit on the edge of your seat, you're going to live a much more productive and a much healthier Christian life because you're much freer. We sang the song a minute ago about freedom. You are much freer than you probably think you are. And it's, that freedom is on the inside of you because the spirit of God, if you're born again, you are spirit, you are soul, and you are body. Your spirit is already perfect before God, the scripture says. You're one-third per- perfect. You, did you hear two amens? That, you know why? Because you don't hear that very often. And you don't think of yourself. Your identity isn't renewed yet that you are one-third perfect. That's your spirit before God. That's why we have to, as believers, learn how to live up out of our spirit instead of out of our flesh, our emotions, what we see, taste, touch, smell, and feel. We have to learn to live by the truth, which is found in God's word, which the Holy Spirit and Jesus Take that word, the bread of life, and make it alive in your spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're going to tune into the word today, and we're going to get something incredible. Everything the father, that the father of lies says is a lie. And so deception. Now, here's the amazing thing about deception. If you ask someone if they are deceived, they will never say no. Exactly. They'll never say, yes, I'm deceived. Why? Because that's what deception is. <laughs> You don't know. And the devil wants you to not know the truth. See, the truth will set you free. And your freedom is found in the truth. Deception keeps you from the truth. So if the enemy can keep your eyes blinded to what God wants you to, that's why this whole series has been about a paradigm shift because the body of Christ has a, Uh, uh, a little bit of a wrong paradigm in a lot of things. We have this paradigm that we've got to pray to get God to do something that he's already done. And he's looking at you like, I already paid that bill. I've already, by by my stripes, you were healed. And you're trying to get me to heal you? No, I already did heal you. You just don't know the truth yet, yet. And we're gonna get the truth You're already free. You already have the ability to say no to addiction, to the different things that seem to hold us captive. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 says, Satan himself masquerades. He puts a mask on. He wants to fake you out. 
He wants to lie to you, but not let you know. He masquerades as an angel of light. Oh, this is a good thing when it's a light. And then, so the enemy works in the realm of deception, lies that come to your mind. He also can work through others in your sphere of influence through lying to them and knowing that oftentimes other people have influence into your life. And so when you sense that you're in a battle with someone, it's not really the person, it's not flesh and blood that you're battling. It is the influence of a lie that someone is believing. Here's the question I wanna ask you, and you don't have to answer it right now, but you can think about this maybe later today. Who are you empowering? Are you empowering the spirit of God to do more, to be bigger? Or are you listening to a lie that maybe seems like truth and in listening, you're empowering the enemy? Because really, I'll show you by scripture in just a second, the power of the enemy has been defeated. And the only power that he really has is the power that you give him. The power that you give him by a wrong belief system. First Peter chapter five, verse six, therefore, here's how, you, here's how you defeat the enemy. You humble yourself. In other words, you get the identity that God says you are. If God says you're an overcomer, well, by golly, you might not feel like one. You might go to the mirror and say, I don't look like one. I don't smell like one. But if the word says you are, Humility comes up under the authority of what the word says, not what you feel or think. Are you with me so far? Humble yourself, demote yourself in your own estimation under the hand of God that in due time you may be exalted. Cast the whole of your care, all of your anxiety, all of your worry, all of your concern. Watch this part once and for all on him. For he cares affectionately about you. Watching, be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind, vigilant, uh, vigilant, and cautious at all time. Here's why. For the enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion in, uh, in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. Verse nine, Withstand him and be firm in the faith against his in, 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 onslaught, rooted, established, strong, immovable, determined. That's what you and I are supposed to do. Knowing that the same identical suffering are appointed to your brothers and the whole body of Christ throughout the world. Yes, yes. What is that saying? That the enemy walks around like a roaring lion looking. Oh, I can't get him. I can't get her. I can't get her, I can't get him, I can't get that one. Why? Because you know who you are. And because the lies, you're not succumb to the lies, you're not open to the lies. But he's looking and he's going, oh, oh, right back in the back. Found one that believes the lies that I tell him. Now I've got an inroad, the devil says. They're not withstanding me, they're believing the identity that I tell them. They're insecure. They're anxious. They're worried. They've bought into the lie. I can go snatch them. And I want you to know the enemy doesn't have that power unless you give it to him. Don't believe his lie. Cast that stuff. Someone, Someone may be saying, well, it seems like the devil has power. Yeah, he wants you to believe that. Uh, this is what happened to me after church last Sunday. I'm coming home, and between my wife and myself, um, three cars pulled out in front of her. One car pulled, one pickup truck pulled over, almost hit me as it pulled over. Stuff flew out of the bed. I'm talking big, heavy stuff flew out of the bed of his pickup truck, landed in front of me. I'm swerving all over the road. I'm watching cars behind me swerve all over. And, uh, uh, and it sure seemed like the devil had power. You ever had one of those days where the tire's flat? You, you work on a sink and you have to go back to the hardware store four times. 
Now, that seems like the devil has power. Are you with me, somebody? It's like I am at the hardware store and I'm looking, I'm saying, I'm going to get everything I need on this trip until I get home and realize the screw is a different type of screw. It's my, none of my tools fit that one. And I go back again and I get it and find out I bought one that's too short. And then I go back again. Okay, so it seems like the devil has power in those times to frustrate you, to aggravate you. And I don't know how all that works, but I know this. If you're still breathing and you're still alive, at the end of the day, your family's still here and Jesus is still sitting on the throne. How many of you know he's still on the throne? Then you've got the victory. (laughs) He does not have power over you He's trying to steal your joy with circumstances. And I don't know how involved he can get in circumstances. However, you're not under circumstances. Your your joy is not succumb to how peaceful your life is. The peace from your heart addresses the issues of life so that when things are crazy around you, The peace on the inside brings peace in the middle of the storm. Jesus got aggravated with his disciples and said, why did you wake me up? I'm in the bottom of this boat. I am sleeping. You should have addressed this storm. Amen. So let me share with you a few things that do open the door. You can open the door to the enemy. One, the first one I mentioned already, lies. Deception. Feelings can lie to you. Emotions can lie to you. You've had it happen. You misunderstand or you misread or you miscalculate a circumstance or a situation that brings feelings, that brings emotions. They are real feelings. I'm not denying your feelings. I am not denying your emotions. But circumstances happen. You've got those feelings. Maturity, and that's what this message is about, is maturity growing up. Learning learning how to, in the face of the lie that you know to be a lie, I know that's not true. You know, people do love you, right? They do. And let me just tell you this. The enemy will lie to you, trying to deceive you, and he'll use emotions and he'll use deception to bring you to a position to get you to embrace the lie of the enemy. The worst kind of way to open the door is to live in a state of insecurity. I talk about insecurity a lot because it is a tool of the devil. Insecurity comes from not knowing who you are in Christ. When you know who you are in Christ, you really get to a place of, I don't care. You don't care what people say. You don't care what people do. You don't care what they think. It's like me blowing my nose in front of you last week. (laughs) I don't care. I love you, and I'm sorry you had to see it. But I'm not going to stop preaching because I had to stop in the middle of the message and blow snot. (laughs) Please forgive me, but guess what? I am who I am. And I am not going to let the devil say to me, boy, that's so embarrassing. (laughs) Amen. 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 The worst thing you could do is embrace insecurity. The best thing you can do is discover who you are in Christ. That's the best thing you can do. Here's two other things that do open the door. The other one is fear. So lies, deception, insecurity, inordinate insecurity. Everybody's overcoming some insecurity, but I'm talking about inordinate insecurity that comes from not knowing who you are. You don't know your identity. But fear is another big one. The enemy will use fear. I watched it. Christian people all through the COVID. Now, I... I understand I'm not getting on anybody, but I saw Christian people behave in, some people behaved in a spirit of fear. I'm your shepherd. I'm your pastor. 
I have to, I can't just let that go without talking and saying, hey guys, look, I know it's real. I know people are dying from it, but here's what I want you to know. You have a covenant. Psalms 91 is a covenant. And, and, and I challenge you to stand on your covenant. I'm not after you and I'm not mad at you and I'm not correcting you in the sense that, you know, I'm not spanking you on purpose. If you're getting spankings, it's the Holy Spirit spanking you, not me. All right. But I watch people embrace fear that, sh that should know better. Now, when the enemy lies to you and brings fear, tries to bring fear into your household or into your life, it is our responsibility as believers to stand in faith. This is why this doesn't happen overnight. We're all at different places of faith. But I do encourage you, don't quit growing in the faith. Study the word. Meditate the word. Uh, confess the word over your life. Read the word over your life. Declare it over your children, over your household. And make it a habit. Really, the truth is, you can overcome a lot of fear just by living a God-first life. Yes. You know, putting, putting God first in every area of your life, uh -huh. doing that. And, th and then the fourth thing that does open the door for the enemy to work in your life is blatant rebellion. Now, we all struggle with a little bit of sin in our life. We all struggle with, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. We have regrets. But I'm talking about where you snub your nose toward the word. The word says these things, and you go, I know it says that, but when you use the but, yeah. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation trial regarding to it as enticement to sin, no matter how it comes or where it leads has overtaken you or laid hold of you that is not common to man. Everybody's dealing with the same type of trials. It says, no temptation or no trials come to you that is beyond human resistance. And that is not adjusted and belongs to human experience such as a man can bear. But God, is faithful to his word, everybody, Amen. and his compassionate nature, and he can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried and assailed beyond your ability and strength to resist the power to endure. But with temptation, he always, circle the word always, yes. Yes. he always provides a way out. Yes. Yes. Let me just tell you, Satan, I want to say this strong. I want you to know this. Satan is defeated. Amen. The Satan of the Old Testament is not the Satan of the New Testament. When Jesus went to that cross and rose from that grave, Satan is a defeated foe, and your authority as a believer is totally different than the Old Testament saints. Don't try to compare one to the other. John 16, 33, this is Jesus. He said, I've told you all these things so that you may have perfect peace and confidence in the world. You will have tribulation, trials, and stress, and frustration. But be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted. For watch what Jesus said. For I've overcome the world and I've deprived it of its power to harm you, and, to, and I have conquered it for you. The devil is defeated. There was a prey that took place, Colossians 2. I got to get to this, 14. It says, he canceled the unfavorable record of our debt with its binding rules and did away with them completely by nailing it to the cross. Yes. And on the cross, Christ freed himself from the power of the spiritual rulers and authorities. And watch this part, this is the good news. And he made a public spectacle yes. of them by leading them as captive in his victory procession. Yes. Amen. There's a paradigm shift, here it is. The paradigm shift is this. The devil is already defeated. Yeah. And this, par this, this parade that Paul talks about was a Roman 
tradition that when the Romans would go in, historically, you can study this, when the Romans would go into an enemy territory, they would defeat the enemy. They would get the king of that territory. They would cut their, toe, their big toes off, both feet. They would cut their thumbs off of their right hand and their left hand. And they would take and strip them completely naked. And by the way, when you read this in some translations, it says Satan was completely stripped naked before the universe and all the demons saw and all the angels saw the work that Christ did. And there was a parade that took place. And here's the parade with no thumbs. Why did they cut the thumbs off? Because that king could never set an example of holding a shield and saying, we will fight again. Try that without a thumb. And his toes, he could never run at full speed again. And so, and his nakedness was to shame him and saying, you are nothing. And when Jesus did the work at the cross, see, Satan overplays his hand. Did you see what that said? On that cross, he bound all the debt that was held against you and all the rules that were binding, you know, the rules of the law. He, they were completely nailed to the cross. Yeah. And on that cross, Christ freed himself from the power of the spiritual rulers and authorities. And he made a public spectacle by leading them as captive. One says a captive train through heaven. When Jesus came up out of that grave on Easter, oh, he said, you follow me, Satan. Naked, stripped, defeated, powerless. And he's parading him through. So when the devil tells you, you're going down, you'd say, oh, you are not lying to me that way. You got to get a little bit of attitude. It's spiritual. The violent, take the violent by force. You need to have a little bit of an attitude that says, uh-uh, Satan, you ain't lying to me. You're not lying to my family. You are not having any more. Not one more family member is going to become addicted. Not one more family member is going to be held captive. Not one more family member. Not one more. We're free in Jesus' name. Are you with me? So let me give you a little, just before, I, before we close up today, I've got more, but I'm going to have to come back next week. Will you let me come back next week? Uh, here's a little bit of a paradigm shift. For example, we think oftentimes an example has been set in the modern day prayer movement that you have to go into a region and send forth the intercessors to bind the strong man in an area. There are regions where the enemy is more powerful in a neighborhood or in a city or a community. You know, you can look at some of the cities in America today where the enemy has a stronghold in that area. But the, here's the misconception, the paradigm shift. The enemy, the enemy wants you to think that we have to send in intercessors. How many of you know the Bible is where we should get our example? Yeah, yeah. Not from the philosophies of men, yeah. the Bible. Right. Here's the thing. Paul would go into some demonically driven cities and never one time in the book of Acts and never one time in the, 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 the apostles in the epistles, did, did Paul ever say, send forth the intercessors? Not one. Not one. Right. Intercessory prayer in the New Testament is different than intercessory prayer in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was pleading with God. Oh God, I call on you, God. Like you gotta motivate God. New, set, New Testament intercession is you coming in between. By the way, Jesus is the great intercessor. He's the mediator between men, between all men. And that might challenge some people who have grown up with that mindset like, oh, I thought we were always supposed to send the intercessors in. Intercessory prayer is good, but it's not what it used to be in the Old Testament. Intercessory prayer today is you standing on behalf of someone else and praying the word and speaking the word yeah. over them. I'm declaring what you declare, God, yeah. about my children, about my spouse, about my cousins, about my coworkers. I'm declaring it. They are saved in Jesus' name. They're yeah. getting saved. They're full of joy. They're living free, interceding before them. Are you with me? 
Okay, so I could go longer on that one. Here's the other one that is a big misunderstanding, and that is the deliverance ministry. There are people today who have called themselves to the deliverance ministry. There was a book written in the 70s that is still kind of a little bit of a popular book, but it was full of all of these formulas that the problem with these formulas for deliverance is they're not in the Bible. One, one day we had a... One day we had a windstorm over here and our plastic letters from the wind blew off and fell. And so they cracked when they hit the asphalt and we got a ladder. I was there when we did it. We got a ladder and we glued those letters back together. But the problem was you could see the glue from the letters where we glued them together. We had Flaky McMasterson, I'm sorry. <laughs> Flaky McMasterson attended our church at that time and she saw demons everywhere. She came in and she pulled me aside and she says, pastor, 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 the witches and the warlocks and the demon spirits in the community have cast a spell upon us. And I said, what are you talking about? What happened? And she escorted me out the front door. And she pointed up to the sign and she said, now, the only way for us to overcome this kind of demonic is you have to get rubber gloves that come to the elbow. You have to get in some type of concoction of vinegar and all this other stuff. I said, That's, that sounds like witchcraft, what you're doing. I mean, it had a mixture of all this stuff. And I said, can you stop for just a second? I'll do what you said to do if you can show me scripture and verse. And she couldn't do it but because I knew that wasn't in there. But where did she get that? She got that from this book on deliverance. Listen, deliverance in the New Testament is never mentioned in the New Testament as a ministry. It happens as a byproduct of bringing Jesus to people. You deliver people as they receive Christ and as you're teaching. People get delivered, yes, but it's not a ministry where you turn it into a whole thing and all you do is look for deliverance and then you fill out a 45 page form. This is, this is happening right now, right now. You go in, you fill out a 45 page form, you set an appointment, you come back two weeks to a month later, you do four or five counseling sessions, and then you get a bucket. True story, you have to puke in the bucket or you weren't delivered. That stuff is real. I mean, people are teaching that. The problem is that's not in the Bible. If you throw up, you may throw up, but it ain't because it's in the Bible. Amen, are you with me? How do you defeat the enemy? This is the last verse I'm gonna share with you today. I'm gonna to come back next week and share more. Here's how you defeat the enemy. John 8, verse 32. You shall know, 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 K-N-O-W, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So watch this. When Paul went into an area he didn't say, pray that the demonic powers would be bound and be defeated. Here's what he said. Pray that I would speak the truth. Pray for me. Pray, you know how to pray for your pastor? Pray for me that I'll speak the truth boldly. Pray for me that I won't back off, that I won't water it down. Pray for me that I won't be a sissy Christian. Pray for me that I'll address the lies of the evil one with the truth of God's word in Jesus' name. Are you with me so far? Amen.